Welcome back guys to my channel for my Songs of Courage series. And today, I'm really excited to talk to you about Roger Scruton. And he, for those of you who don't know, he is really quite a famous English philosopher who unfortunately passed away from cancer in January. He wasn't very old, just in his 60s. And it's a great loss to many of us, to all of us. He, he was quite formative and transformative for a lot of people and especially young artists like like me and so I I wanted to situate this song that I wrote in his honor a little while back in the context of songs of courage because I like that he's a unique example of courage I think often we think of sort of the the really valiant outspoken sort of visibly courageous in in the sort of archetypal ways but in our times, so much of what requires courage is being able to stand firm for your convictions in spite of perhaps some excessive influence of ideology or kind of around every corner. And I think Scruton was a beautiful example of that. And, and not only that he was courageous, but he always, in this very sort of incredibly consistent way, remained a gentleman, he remained kind, he remained very gentle in his approach, and yet kept up absolute conviction, firmness, and intellectual rigor in his work. And I think he is such an example for us, and I, I mean, I would be curious to see where he was at my age and how that developed over time, because I, he is definitely one of very few people I, I want to emulate in my own life as an artist and a person and as an intellectual in any capacity that I I do that. I I had a friend the other day tell me that I sometimes seem sad in my videos. <laughs> but I you know, I think part of that is because I'm really trying to be very intentional about the tone in my videos as primarily gentle and conversational because I don't I think a lot of the things that I sometimes do talk about or maybe will talk about are controversial enough in themselves just for the things that I'm saying sometimes and I I it, I don't need to make it more intense than that so someone like Sir Roger Scruton yes he's a sir the knighted the knighted Roger Scruton the philosopher Roger Scruton and a few others are models for me not just in terms of the ideas but this this beautiful mode of communication that signals dignity and respect and conviction, but always with a view to having proper intellectual and civil discourse. So I, I really, really love him. And the article that I recently published, which I'm going to link below, it was published recently in Dappled Things, which is an online Catholic journal that focuses a lot on art of various kinds. So poetry and um, short stories. I've submitted some of my music. They published that, and my short, wistful kind of article in that is just about my own personal exchange with him, which was very limited. I would not want to give the impression that it was more of a mentorship than it was, but he was very kind enough to write back to me when I reached out about 10 years ago, and his taking time with me really left an impression and served as a huge encouragement for me at that time um, to have somebody of his stature sort of sign off on my work a little bit in some small way by validating it with his time was very significant and I, I'm under the impression he probably did that with many people because that was his heart was to to be available to young artists who are trying to find their way and I'll get back into that in a sec but I'll that's just sort of the context. So if you want to read that um, that article, um, I'm going to link it below and it just sort of details that back and forth and a little bit of a reflection on him as a man and I would love if you would check that out. And then I also wrote a song about him, which is why this specific commentary is coming up today and it's called Dear Roger. It's a very simple song, but it was just meant to honor him. And the, the key chorus, if you will, is um, Defender of Beauty, Guardian of Philosophy, 
used words as gallantry. So I hope that you'll you'll check that out. Um, it's very dear to my heart. So I guess I wanted to touch on a couple of uh, other things about him. Um, it's in truth, I I have read in the scheme of things very little of his body of work, and I I hope to include a lot more of his work as I as I go forward in my life, as particularly when I have the the chance to have a library, a proper library. I would like to have a lot of copies of his works and read them. <laughs> um, they're not just for show. I think a lot of people think that books can be just for show, but you should read them before they claim a spot on your shelf. But he, he does have one very particular documentary really but essentially it was a, a paper he delivered in video format with with BBC about beauty and not just holding up beauty as something worth talking about but actually discussing what he calls the cult of ugliness that developed in artistic circles in the 20th century and I think we've been steeping in an understanding of art as just sort of this unfiltered expressivism rather than a cultivated sculpting of your human experiences and emotional life and putting that into a format that is edifying to your listener. Those are very different things, um, but in the and and that the second way that I described it with a view to beauty and edification was the traditional understanding of art for eons. I mean, it was, that's what art was ordered towards. And then we had this shift that was really quite dramatic in the 20th century towards art being anything that you just call art. Art being sort of a vomiting of the messiness of your interior life and, and leaving it at that. So that's where you see things like we saw this year. Somebody duct taped a banana, like a real banana that was going rotten to a wall and it sold for a hundred grand or something. So when you reduce it so radically, reduce art so radically to anything goes, this is sort of the product rather than the beautiful edifices and sculptures and paintings that we saw throughout the many of the centuries that came before. So, you know, you don't, you don't get Michelangelo when you are saying art can be anything and there are lots of other better examples but that's a, a common one that a lot of people know so strangely I mean maybe not strangely but I guess it's because when you you focus on art you actually do start to understand so many of the philosophies behind which expressions people choose because I mean there's obviously an underpinning of nihilism when it's sort of like here's the ugliest state of my heart and nothing matters and I'm just expressing that um, versus someone who maybe has an eternal perspective or at least a very noble human perspective. They likely value tradition. They love, likely value the great thinkers of the centuries that have gone before, whereas there's sort of a revolutionary spirit in a lot of modern work. Not all modern, obviously, but just that this tendency in modern art to be kind of destructive and to have no sense or reason or sort of interior meaning. There's sort of this revolutionary spirit, this taking down of anything classicist, anything traditional. It's all just got to come down for the sake of being able to pour out ugliness for who knows what reason. I mean, honestly, it's not something I, I can get inside of or understand. But he critiques that very heavily and tries to point his listeners toward this different understanding of edification and beauty as real values uh, worth fighting for, particularly as an artist, but also throughout the whole society, because the other side of it is that the things that we consume through art affect us and fundamentally in the end, eventually, morally even, they, they induce us towards a different way of interacting with the world, whereas beauty sort of right away intuitively calls us upwards to something better. 
Now, I will differentiate between beauty and sentimentality. Unfortunately, what a lot of people think is beautiful now is actually just very thin sentimentality, and that's very disappointing for me. I think Christians in particular are notorious for brutal, brutal sentimentality. Even when there's a natural gifting there, there seems to be a lack of inspiration or knowledge or aesthetic training such that they would grasp the true reality of, um, of beauty as being a deep thing and not just sort of a readily available candy version. It, just because something's immediately pleasurable does not make it beautiful or really very good artistically. Um, and I try to, I try to stay away from giving particular examples, but I, unfortunately it's extremely common in, in most, I would say, Christian and Catholic circles right now. So when he talks about beauty, he's talking about this higher reality, which takes into account the, the depths of suffering and misery and questioning and difficulty that it is to be human, but, but always with the sort of view of bending it towards having a redemptive quality and a sense of order and meaning. And that is extremely valuable. So that, that's, I would say, the thing that he's most left us, not necessarily because it was all he talked about. He, he was an expert in many different fields and a prolific writer. But that documentary, I know, with BBC went very, very big and currently now even has millions of views on, on YouTube, which is a lot for a, philosoph a public intellectual or philosopher, in particular, philosopher of beauty, right? That's a strange thing in our time. So for that, it's, it's been very influential. So I encourage you to watch that. It's, it's, it's pretty mind bending if these are things you've never thought about before. And even if you disagree with lots of parts, that's fine. But I think he, he really offers something profound and important. Um, he also, he, he's actually quite well known for his political philosophy as well. He was very opposed to socialism as well. And, you know, I didn't pick up anything that I'm talking about from him, but I do feel like I'm in good company when I critique that in some of my other videos. Um, and so I also encourage you to listen to him on that. He, unfortunately, I think, had he been growing as a, as a voice and an intellectual in our times, he would now be categorized as, you know, a right-wing radical or something, which is so far from the truth as to be laughable. I mean, he was just a good, kind-hearted man with a brilliant mind seeking and sharing the truth of both um, history and just sort of intrinsic sense he is actually, in his last few years, um, became extremely popular, I think, particularly in post-communist states like Eastern Europe. They just loved him so much because he understood so deeply a lot of their experience and plight. And so he was, I think, recently, or pretty soon before he passed away um, in January, he was honored in some really beautiful way in the Czech Republic, I believe. But at the same time, what's interesting, I guess we were starting to see sort of what I would expect that he would have suffered a lot sooner in his life. Um, a couple years before he died, he was made a, a very brutal target um, of sort of the Saul Alinsky tactics. Rule number 12, pick the target, freeze it, polarize it. So they, they picked him because I think he'd been chosen to be on some kind of board and and you know he had these sort of traditionalist conservative classicist anti-socialist views and he was targeted and brutalized um, his reputation was just totally ripped apart it was horrible and I think he's a wonderful example of that being real because you can't find someone more admirable in terms of his approach to discussing real questions and yet he was made an absolute target in the more, most horrific way and that example is one of the things that inspired me to be more forthright about my concerns about our generation's lack of understanding of the backdrop for a lot of the drivers behind socialist movements because if you can obliterate a man like Scruton you, you almost have no conscience. I mean, it, it's, it's, it's horrific. So I encourage you to get to know the man so you can affirm that because 
he is so good and kind. Um, that he took time with me as a young artist back and forth was extremely telling of who he was internally. So I think at this point it probably goes without saying that he's been hugely formative for me as an artist and just one thing I would like to highlight in relation to that is that his work and his focus and articulation on art as ordered to beauty helped me stand firm although it was difficult. I worked with a record label for a little while and, you know, explored some ways of trying to be in the music industry for quite a few years. But at the root, I always had this deep conviction rooted in the way he had expressed the value of art that I had to stay focused on my work being beautiful and authentic. And I'm so grateful because it would have been, it could have been very, very easy for me to get caught up in the trends or the sort of, yeah, there are just some really, I think there, I think there's some real principles at work in the music industry right now that undercut any kind of encouragement for real art and real stories and thoughtful lyrics and unique melodies and, and especially longer form works. I mean, at this point, it's to your benefit to have a two minute song because you get more spins on Spotify. Like it's, it's that crazy. Um, So while I still try to navigate everything, because you have to function within the times you're in, and the medium you're given, and the voice you have, but constantly scrutins in the backdrop, reminding me that beauty is, is valuable, and art ought to point to it. So I think it's largely because of him that I was able to maintain a hierarchy of, of value such that even if when it was hard it was more valuable to me to have a smaller audience where I could be honest about what I cared about rather than trying to chase after views for the sake of views and money and fame or whatever I just I'm really that I mean maybe he ruined my life but <laughs> no I, I, that's an absolute joke but um, I'm very grateful that he was part and parcel of me having the courage to live out my authentic life as an artist and that he will continue to be that for me is is a sure thing. So thank you so much for letting me introduce you to him and I hope that you'll get to know him better. Uh, definitely start with my little article below through Dappled Things and the song as well as through that article and it's called Dear Roger. Um, I'd really appreciate it if you'd share this, if you love him, that you would want to share a little bit more about about him with a broader audience and if you want to like or if you have any if you have heard of him or you have any questions please uh link like uh comment below and I'll, I'll try to respond to those I'm trying to be good about keeping up with those and subscribe to this channel for more songs on courage I've got at least two more songs and commentaries coming and lots more themes coming throughout 2020 so I hope to see you back soon take care have a great day